I've always viewed engineering as synonymous with design. Uh, I remember my uh, mathematics guidance counselor who saw I was good at math and said, hey, you know, you don't want to go into mathematics because you'll never make money in that field. Go into engineering. And guess why I became an engineer. That, that's how I became an engineer. But then when I got into electrical engineering, uh, which is what my first choice was, I, I soon figured out that, hey, these guys are kind of cool dudes because they're actually doing things for society and getting, getting technology advanced, and they're sort of applying all the physics and math. So um, I'm, I'm interested in the creativity that, lean, that lends itself to products and systems that help. I believe in first, let me have the system concept. Well, first, what is it we want to do? Let me generate a blog diagram in very simple-minded fashion of what it's going to take to get from point A to point B in this system. Um, let me do a system level analysis by hand, not by computer yet. Uh, yes, I'll make approximations and so forth, but this is just to get my understanding going. Then when I get the understanding going, let me put in some circuit hardware in for some of the subsystem blocks and still do the manual analysis. And after I, I'm pretty well convinced myself, this may take me months to do all this, okay, but after I pretty much convince myself that I have a fundamental understanding, then I'll go to the computer and start refining and extracting the parasitics and modifying the design. But every time I modify a design, I go back to my hand analysis and say, ah, it's that term there that gets moved downward. Do I want to get it downward? No, I actually want to go the other way, so I better change this other parameter. And I think without the concepts, I wouldn't understand that. So I'm a very, as you suffer through, you, you, I'm a very strong believer in those fundamentals. One concepts. of the projects uh, in the more recent past that I was involved in with, was at the startup of Nord, Centera Networks, and we were designing delay equalizers um, to, to, essentially, to, to essentially make the, the time delay, the steady state time delay, as constant as possible, independent of frequency in a 15 gigahertz communications channel. Um, and so the, the idea of getting constant delay at these frequencies is very, very tricky, as you might imagine. Uh, after many, many iterations, I eventually ended up with a passive circuit, the active circuits at 15 gigahertz, we're going to hack it at this point. And the, the passive circuit not only had inductances and capacitances, but they had coupled inductances and capacitances. Mm -hmm. So I was relying on coupling, not not trying to remove it. I wanted the coupling in this case. In this case. Uh, well, it turns out, I figured out very quickly that there was no way I was going to do a thorough analysis by hand with this. You could start that way, but it's just impossible. So we had to go to a three-dimensional simulator, which I think was called ADS. It was, by, it was invented by Agilent. And what, what ADS would do is you, you put in the parameters of your inductors and how you're going to lay it out, and presumably you put in your parasitics ultimately. And ADS will essentially give you a map of the fields and show you where they go in the chip and where they're coupling in and so forth. You can literally map the fields. And so, for example, if you see a field coming down into the substrate, coming back up the other end and hitting this transistor, ah, it's talking to this transistor, and I don't want it to talk to that transistor. So let me put isolation. I literally dig a ditch in the in the in the bulk, a, a trench basically, fill it with oxide to stop the field, to insulate the field. Well, what I didn't know at that time, my naivety was such that when you do that, you're going to change other things in the circuit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I killed the field, but I probably worsened some other parameter. In fact, I know I worsened the GM of other transistors and so forth and so on. And so and I and I and to this day, as I sit here talking to you. I'm not so sure that I've figured out the optimum way of approaching this. I still went to an iterative approach, but that first trench I put in had to be modified, thinned out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I let some of the field, maybe you know, 20% of it coupled in, but not 80% 80, 80 of it. And it, it's sort of always a balancing act. And, and those things where you simply cannot do a satisfying analysis by hand has always remained troubling. So I'm thinking, if you have to do some surgery, like people get appendicitis or whatever routine surgery, once the surgeon's in there, why don't we implant the circuit, maybe glue it onto the aorta or whatever, paste it on the aorta somehow, mm -hmm. and let the circuit essentially do kind of like a GPS scan of the internal organs of the body. Right. Kind of look at the stomach, the aorta, the liver, the kidney, whatever the case may be, and essentially tell the surgeon, hey, well, in fact, Keep the circuit in there. We'll power it up externally by just putting an electromagnetic wand on the chest and so forth when we want to hook the guy up to a computer. And when we do hook him up on a computer, we'll see the internal GPS scan of his organs, his right. or her organs. 
Um, <clears throat> now, you're not going to operate just to get this into a person, but you know, once the guy's in there, and a lot of people have to do surgery, fine, let's get it in there. And so every six months, we'll come up to the computer and we'll see what the status is. They might even be able to detect tumors and so forth, even before they're a problem. Right.